Hello and welcome to the Hear That podcast. This is Aaron West, and today you're going to hear that Dr. Hyung Ju Lim, sociologist and academic. She works at Bournemouth University, where she completed her PhD, uh, East Asian Mothers Living in Britain. And she has written for The Conversation online and is currently in the process of writing journal articles on transnational family justice, drawing on North Korean defectors and human rights activism among defectors based in the UK. Most recently, she contributed to the New York Times for a perspective on the Champions League final with a focus on Tottenham Hotspur's South Korean striker Son Hyung Min. Regular listeners will know that Ju is the wife of poet and educator Rob Casey, who also has been on the podcast, and he does actually come up in our conversation a little later on. What I've loved so far about making these podcasts is, quite frankly, the fact that after each one, I feel like I've learned something. I'm not actually very smart, but I am good at pretending to be. So it's great to have the opportunity to talk with those that know so much more, and, you know, so much more about interesting and important things, like cultural expectations, the treatment of North Korean defectors, and the problems in our education system. Not just, you know, the silly things that I always retain, like the name of every planet or moon stolen by Davros and the Daleks in that episode of Doctor Who once. And sometimes, every once in a while, a conversation is had and you remember why we evolved to talk in the first place. To solve problems, figure things out, to learn about each other and how similar we really all are, despite growing up half the world away. Okay, um, should I say hello? Yeah, just go for it. Oh. Hello, hello everyone. Um, <laughs> my name is Dr. Hyunju Lim, and normally I'm called a Jew. Um, I'm originally from South Korea. Currently, I'm working on a research project on uh, North Korean defectors. Mm-hmm. So I've done so far two different stages of research related to North Korean defectors. Um, so the first one was about the uh, human rights activism. And from that research, I've kind of noticed uh, women's issues sort of emerged quite prominently. So I wanted to explore further. So um, I did a second phase research with the female defectors, uh, issues around basically human rights abuse faced by uh, especially women defectors. Um, so at the moment I'm writing about what I found. And Probably, um, I don't know, you might have a chance to uh, have a look at the, uh, my article in the conversation. So I've written about it uh, in a couple of yeah, you know, did, articles. Yeah. And prior to that, uh, my uh, PhD research was about the East Asian mothers in Britain, uh, which I just published as a book. So that is more to do with, I mean, in all of my research, actually, um, I mean, it's kind of a probably I need to sort of give a bit of a, you know information about myself to get to my research is the, the fact I'm coming from South Korea is very important as I mentioned at the beginning but also you know why I came to actually Britain um, so um, I mean when I came to Britain which was 18 years ago wow that tells how much you know how old I am <laughs> <laughs> Um, I came here to learn English, um, but actually, on reflection, when I looking back, um, I think I was running away. Right. As obviously, you know, at the time I didn't realize it, mm. but I was running away from, I suppose, kind of a, in a way, you know, the female oppression. Um, so you know, I, I grew up in a very nice you know family environment um, but uh, my parents sort of raise their daughters as a second class citizens right. and they raised us quite different from my brothers so you know they have uh, five children two sons and three daughters so I suppose my life always felt like overshadowed by the uh, you know my especially one of my brothers and uh, you know his success or failure really affected the kind of over mood of my parents and therefore affected me because I lived with, with, my, with my parents. Um, so, you know, when you live in this kind of environment, but also constantly told, you know, what you should be doing and, you know, the uh, sort of social expectations, norms as a girls and daughters, 
I suppose deep down somewhere you want to kind of have your own life. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that was quite um, obviously at the time, I couldn't quite articulate the way I felt about my life and, uh, you know, what was going on. Uh, but when I actually looking back, I really wanted to have the sort of ownership, uh, you know, uh, over my life. So um, when I came to Britain, um, I mean, initially, I didn't actually uh, mean to um, uh, go to university again because I already studied biology in Korea. So I was a graduate. Um, but I, w I suppose the whole journey from, you know, prior to um, my British life to, uh, you know, current life is actually, it's about self-discovery and, you know, uh, finding out about who I am, really. Uh, so that really has sort of influenced uh, my research. So when I um, decided to go to university again, I discovered this amazing subject called the sociology. Even though in Korea, when I was in Korea, I, I knew about uh, sociology, hmm. but I, I, I think it, it was something for me very alien subject, uh, always associated with uh, sort of a very left-wing politics. That's what I remember. Right. Uh, then I was sort of looking through some books in the bookshop one day, and then somehow this sociology textbook sort of came to my hand, and then it caught my attention. Um, so I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, explore that. Um, so that's how I started. And when I actually started my study at Bath, uh, you know, it was just amazing for me because the all along you always feel your inner struggle as a personal issues. But so what sociology does is actually the, the personal issues are actually structurally shaped. So all of a sudden you can see the kind of these broader pictures and you can situate yourself and some of the issues you think coming from your own problems and or, you know, issues are actually not just your own, but it's actually coming from the outside forces and the cultural issues. So having that cross-cultural experiences, you know, was for me absolutely fascinating, but also really, um, in many ways, fruitful in terms of, uh, you know, the way I started to really understand myself. Hmm. So, um, so, so uh, yeah, that's a good point, actually, because when I started looking into what you've done and I, mm. and I looked at your articles on the conversation mm. and, um, and, and that sort of brief thing that's on, on Amazon for your book as well, what I sort of thought was, well, this has definitely got to be about you, hasn't it? It's got to be about mm. you finding out kind of about yourself, which yep. is, you know, sounds like a, a stereotype, but it's actually important because the book is about identity. So, yeah. I mean, I wondered about that, about how actually the process of coming into a new country mm. was for you, and you said 18 years ago. Was mm. Bath the first place that you went to? No, I um, came to uh, Ramsgate in Kent. Right, um, <laughs> very different. <laughs> it's very different, yes. So I actually didn't have a clue about uh, Britain at all. Obviously, right. we, we knew, you know, the Britain and England uh, nominally, mm -hmm. but I didn't really know about anything. and. Uh, you know, like everybody else, when you don't know about the um, particular country in depth, you have these stereotypes. Sure. So um, I had uh, this, you know, always covered with fog <laughs> and uh, English gentleman okay. with wearing top hat. Right. That was my impression. And then I landed in Ramsgate. Yeah, no, that you're not going to get that there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, just this... Guys walking around topless <laughs> most of the time during the summer, and I was like, "Where's English gentleman?" <laughs> and then I think it was a bit of a culture shock because Ramsgate is a, a bit of a deprived area, quite in in you know the majority of, uh, part of Ramsgate. And uh, the first thing I think I've noticed was a lot of teenage mothers. Right. So in in Korea because. Um, it's very rare for uh, actually to, to see teenage mothers or, or even though there are, it's, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, social stigma. So people don't outrightly walk around with buggies mm. in their teens. We just presume if you're a teen, you should be a high school. Sure. 
So I think that was quite a bit of a culture shock, and then I started to understand, you know, a bit of these different things. Um, but yes, the Ramsgate. So I was there for two years. Right. <laughs> what was was that studying? Yes, I was doing my um, English course, and then I went to uh, college to do uh, business studies. Because I, before I actually um, decided to study sociology, I wanted to. I was thinking about doing MBA. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I was toying with the different ideas, and then I realized probably MBA isn't for me. Um, so yeah. Yeah, a, a whole new world, really. I, th- I mean, everyone always talks about how East and West are so different. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, your book is more about uh, culture mm-hmm. um, and <clears throat> sort of person-to-person relationships. You were saying before we began recording about how you have felt uh, disconnected for a long time. Yes. Um, and I, actually, I can imagine why, you know, especially if you're talking about Ramsgate being the first one. But but what what do you think is, is the cause of that? Well, I think, um, you know, the... Um... The, when I came through the airport immigration for the first time, that was such a shock because when I left to uh, South Korea, I was really excited. I do remember when the plane took off, you know, my heart was beating and I was just absolutely thrilled to uh, have this new adventure in my life. Yes. And then 11, 12 hours later, I landed in Britain. And then when I went through immigration, uh, that was really, really um, just something I didn't expect. Right. Um, so at the time, I couldn't really speak English uh, mm-hmm. very well, hardly. So very basic, hi, um, thank you, that, you know, that level. And I couldn't really understand what people are saying either because um, even though I studied English about 12 years in Korea, that was more about grammar, reading Slang, and writing. So, right not actually speaking and or listening yeah. but also we we're pretty much used to american english okay so the british accent was for me very alien mm. but also i think on top of that it was the whole attitude of the other uh, whole immigration officers they really treat me like uh, like a dirt so you know when you lived in your country i mean say to uh, other people as well you think your country is the center of the universe how big or how small that's how you believe. And then I realized actually people don't even know there is a country called South Korea. And then these immigration officers really saw me as somebody, I don't know, uh, not as a, you know, someone who spent lots of money to this country, but actually someone, I don't know, trying to get something out of it. So they put me in sort of quarantine to make sure I, I didn't bring any germs. So I was there about for an hour. Wow. Um, so I think that experience really, I think the, the first, uh, you know, coming through that immigration really, really shaped my uh, experience for the rest of actually uh, my life in this country. And then um, before I came here, my agent basically organized the schools and the accommodation. Mm-hmm. So I went into this, um, live with this lady who was doing this host family thing as a business. So it was her full-time job. But she was very um, discriminatory. Right. Um, she hated Koreans. And she made it very clear to me. Specifically? Yeah. She told me I hate Koreans. And I was Korean, <laughs> right? Lovely. Lovely um, person. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was really, I mean, so I lived with... Um, how many were there? Were about three, four different girls from Japan, Taiwan, Colombia, who were there already about three, four months. So they were able to speak. So, you know, they were having a chat and they had a very good relationship with this landlady. But I was the only one who couldn't really talk. And then it was obvious that she liked all of them except me. Right. So I guess, um, you know, and then if you live in a country where you, you know, English is not your mother tongue, mm. that really set your confidence. So um, when I was in Korea, uh, I was very articulate and I was very funny. So, you know, when I was in high school, my teacher actually um, suggested me to go on a um, radio program for a comedy show because I was quite hilarious. And I was always 
made my uh, classmate laugh with, uh, you know, very playfulness with my Korean language. Mm. But with English, I just couldn't do that. And I do remember just before I came to England, I was making jokes with my friends uh, with Korean words. And they said to me, what are you going to do when you go to England? Because you can't do this when you go to England, because obviously, you know, English is not your mother tongue. So I said, yeah. And then it was very true. Because, you know, when I look at, for instance, Rob, you know, uh, the way he used English to write poetry and make, you know, people laugh, it's amazing. I would like to do that, but I can't because, you know, uh, that's what it is. So I think... Um, that's quite a difficult thing then because that's stripping a, a huge part of your personality away. Absolutely. I mean, you know, so, so when I was, I mean... When I was in Korea, you know, throughout my primary schools and middle school, I was a head of a school. I was the uh, head of a class all through the uh, primary school years. I used to attend meetings for as a representative of school, mm. and then I used to be able to articulate and very confident. And then all of a sudden, you see yourself completely awkward socially because you go out to uh let's say you know social settings people talking about things i'm not culturally used to you know what i mean i mean one example i was talking about this with my friend for example david bowie okay if you grew up with it it's something natural you can talk about it quite easily yeah but for me that person is very alien obviously now i know well i mean i think most people over here think he's alien as well <laughs> but, but yeah. you know um so because I, the, the reason why I'm talking about David Bowie is I do remember one particular evening we were having this party so with the, you know, Rob's friends. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about David Bowie. And then for me, it was kind of, a, who is this guy, right? right. Was, it, was this just after he died? Is, is, is no, this... no, no. It was many years ago. He oh, was okay. still alive. Okay. Um, so, you know, at the time, obviously, I was in this country not as long as now. And yeah. then, you know... Um, so, you know, things like that. So you can't really easily kind of uh, mix with the people. Sure. Or it just really, really shapes your confidence in well, many ways. Th- that's, that's always a question I've sort of wanted to pick out as well, because obviously it's very easy to look at um, immigration and go, well, well, why aren't they integrating? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't mm. they but it's exactly what you're saying. It's that actually there is always going to be these little cultural barriers mm. that you don't know exist until mm. you actually start talking to people. And I, I imagine that's probably why there is a, um, uh, there's this sort of need to find people who are like yourself. I mean, did, mm. did you do that? Did you seek for other other people, you know, other Koreans, other Asians? You know, is that what you did? Mm, not especially. I mean, in many ways, I have to, well, I'm a quite solitary person and I do need uh, that solitude and I enjoy it. Mm. And uh, when I came to, for instance, Ramsgate, I, you know, because it's also to do with the fact I was running away from Korea. So I think that really also affected. So when I was in Ramsgate, there were lots of Koreans already and uh, quite a few of them used to live together because they were lonely mm-hmm. and they used to party together. But I never really um, be part of it because I didn't want to. And right. But that makes sense. If you're leaving a place, then it makes sense that you were kind of getting away from that culture. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I guess uh, having said that, um, you know, a university or other places, you always have more sort of a connection with uh, people from sort of overseas, international students. So I, I guess in some ways, you know, I was sort of a, seeking uh, friendships with the people from other countries. But, you know, that, that, is, that can be also quite difficult if you are not in a university setting or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because when there are really, uh, I don't know, people from other countries. So it was sort of like, a, yeah, um, I just found it quite difficult to actually make friends for many years. Yeah, I can understand that. I, I was going to read a little section of your book, actually. Yeah. It's very, it's very early on, um, because as I say, I, I went through the Amazon thing. Um, because, I, again, it is to do with what you were running mm. away from. Yeah. Um, so it says here that the, the book highlights the persistent influence of their 
East Asian gendered beliefs, mostly rooted in their cultural or national heritage, mm -hmm. simultaneously intersected by other factors such as the location of settlement and their husband's gender beliefs linked to their national ethnic back backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I, I was kind of, this kind of uh, pointed me in the in direction of, of this huge conversation at the moment, mm. which is about a gender and things mm. and about uh, culture. I mean, is are the two are the two that highly matched? Is it, is is it one affecting the other or? Um, it's a tricky thing, but you know, the based on my research, what I found is definitely the sort of gendered experiences are shaped within the uh you know the cultural national and uh, settings right um so in a way there are it, it, it isn't just about culture but also there are politics there are economic aspects mm -hmm. all of this kind of work together to create the kind of environment factors to to shape you know people's perceptions and the behavior so if i give an example um historically let's say um, East Asia, especially South Korea, was heavily influenced by Confucianism, which coming from China. Mm. So you could say, uh, in a very simplistic manner, these two countries might share kind of similar experiences on, in that regard. However, because China uh, have gone through quite significant differences in terms of, you know, the communist sort of ideology and government. So since 1949, when Mao became sort of the chairman, they went through huge transformation in terms of uh, gender relations because uh, based on sort of Marxist ideology, they're trying to achieve gender equality. Um, and one of the things they really uh, believed was uh, women's participation in employment. Mm. And they really believed that could bring uh, you know, equal relations between to the two genders. Yeah. So they introduce a whole range of uh, policies that helps women to be able to uh, continue their work. Mm -hmm. And even though they have children and also, you know, guarantee lifetime employment and whole lots of benefits, which right. is very different from South Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that regard, the kind of, uh, you know, gender relations and belief uh, Chinese women have uh, is very different from Korean women because right. a lot of Chinese women, especially middle class women, believe you know if they are educated and if they have opportunities, they should work. Right. So if they don't have jobs, they feel ashamed. So in that regard, uh, it's quite different because a lot of South Korean women believe, or a lot of middle class South Korean women, give up their job to get married and raise children. Right. So there are big differences. And then, you know, when, when you look at my book, South Korean women talk differently about their experiences as mother and, uh, and, you know, because a lot of them actually give up their job because they believe if they carry on working while they have uh, young children, that will damage their children psychologically. Right, okay. But Chinese women don't believe that. Having said that, having said that, ultimately, they also share very similar experiences. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not simplistic. So yeah. the, you, on the surface, you think they are very different. But still, Chinese women talk about, you know, the, the man is the head, women is the kind of, you know, the kind of helping, you know, the secondary role. There are still continuing this gender imbalance everywhere. And then that is actually reflected in Chinese government's approach as well. So on the surface, they propagate gender equality. Mm -hmm. But deep down, they actually continue to have segregated uh, policies. Why is that? Well, you know, this is a it's it's a difficult thing. In some ways, probably it's I don't know. It's a strategic one, mm -hmm. in my view. Women always have been exploited by the state. Sure, it's yeah. a women the cheap labor. <laughs> Uh, this possible, uh, position of, uh, subject position of women are very convenient to have because, for instance, this is not just applying East Asia. It's the same as in this country. You know, uh, during the war, women are called to the factory to do work while men are fighting in the, you know, uh, better ground. Mm -hmm. When men returned, they the need shelter. to create, yes, right. space for men. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they start to push women out of, uh, 
workplace or yeah, factory. Even though they've just proved that they can do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, the government and possibly the media, especially in China's case, they work together to mm -hmm. create certain propaganda mm -hmm. um, to actually manipulate people's, you know, mind. For instance, you know, the examples of China. Obviously, when Chairman Mao came into uh, power, he really tried to, on the surface, eradicate the Confucian ideology because mm. he saw it as a backward thing. But in fact, they still continue to use that sort of gender-divided kind of discourse, uh, if I may say, to shape the family relations because, in a way, from a sort of a more um, governmental or sort of a state point of view, having that sort of a uh, division might be something quite convenient to have. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a sort of a man as the head of family and then women kind of taking, looking after household. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they both work, but at the same time, there is a sort of this uh, established sort of ideology, yeah. which kind of... A, keep the family in place in a way. Um, the, the, a lot of countries, it's just not China, but also Korea, North Korea as well mm. at the moment, you know, it's full of paradoxes and contradictions. Yeah, I think every society is. In, in yeah. a, I think, yes, so there was a bit that I actually, I think I definitely read it in your book, but um, basically you were saying that, I'm sure I read it in yours, um, that the women are taught to basically be uh, subservient to the eldest son or the sons mm -hmm. um, afterwards. So, that, so basically, they're always dominated by the husband, and then it's yes. and then it's the son yes. as well. Yeah. I mean that that really surprised me. That really shocked me, actually. Yeah, I think would, um, in Korea, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are changing, but at yeah. the same time, people still prefer sons. A lot of people do. Uh, prefer to uh, actually daughters right. um, and uh, you know they still ho hold this idea about men is the uh, kind of uh, head of the uh, family so if there is a husband died for instance then elder son will uh, replace that position some sort of uh, you know the kind of something to rely on uh, mentally mm. so there is this uh, you know that when I actually look at South Korea as an interesting case because, you know, technologically, it's very advanced. Yeah, but, yeah, it is. <laughs> and also, I mean, socially and culturally, things are really changing fast. But at the same time, a lot of practices and beliefs are continued to be very, in many ways, kind of a traditional mm -hmm. ways. And do you, th do you think that women are seen as um, less... Uh, you said reliable uh, for, for men. Is, are they seen as less reliable because they end up getting um, married and married off to other families, therefore they're sort of useful to other people, whereas men, I guess, bring people in traditionally? Mm, yeah, I yeah. Say. I mean, there are aspects of it. I mean, for example, when I look at my parents, mm. you see, this, this is interesting because... All of um, their children, so, you know, two sons and three daughters, mm -hmm. they will send them to universities. And then when I was studying here, they pay for my tuitions. Right. Okay, my parents. So a lot of money. Um, so in one way, obviously, they, they believed in, you know, educating their daughters. Mm. But that was actually to find a decent husband. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. Wow, okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah. When I when you grew up, my brothers were always encouraged and pushed to be right at the top and, you know, uh, to to be the best as they can be. Daughters less so. Mm. I don't think they did bother that much because they knew uh, in the end we are going to get married to someone else and we will be belong to that family. Right. That's how my parents believed. So, that's, restric that's restrictive. No wonder that you wanted to do things yourself as well then. You mean... Well, I mean, if, to have that worldview put on you, I mean, that's, that must mm. be suffocating. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's also very confusing. Mm. That's why I think when I was in Korea, I spent a lot of time just 
mentally wandering around, <laughs> uh, didn't know what to do because in some ways I had a re- very dis- strong traditional upbringing, mm. um, which puts me in certain slot me into uh, this subservient position. Sure. At the same time, obviously I was educated, I was reading. Um, therefore, you know, I knew somewhere deep down this wasn't, you know, life I wanted. Um, so, but yes, so I think as you pointed out, n- nowadays a lot of parents don't feel they are selling their daughters to somebody else's families. Mm. But there are still other people like my parents who believe once they get married, their daughters will belong to someone else's families. Right. So the sons are the one who carry on. The other one is actually the ritual. You know, in Korea, when uh, parents die, the sons carry on the kind of uh, rituals to worship the uh, dead ancestors. Okay. It's, it's a kind of a uh, Korean tradition. Mm-hmm. Obviously, people are Christians and you know have a Western religion. So they don't necessarily follow their rituals, but mm-hmm. still, people believe. Um, they will be looked after even after dead by the sons, not the, by the daughters. <laughs> it just seems so odd to me, yeah. especially since presumably um, elderly care is usually put to the feet of, of, of to the women. Yes. So that doesn't that that seems very that well that is hypocritical as you said, you know. Yeah, it's really um, this is the thing. You know, that's it's just so full of paradoxes and just the contradictions because. When I look at, for instance, my mom, she was actually, she was very dominant. Mm. So she, in reality, she was the head of the family, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. In actual fact. <laughs> but, um, but it was, she always believed, you know, men are better, men are superior. And, you know, my, my father is the, uh, the head. Mm-hmm. And the, my brothers were, needs to be more respected. Yeah. So it's just... And then, but then the actual jobs are done by women. It, well, this is again what, what you talk about in your book is about the split of like even household duties. Yeah. Um, what, what's the difference there then between sort of uh, South Koreans and, uh, and and English people? Because obviously with Rob, British guy, what, what, what is what, what kind of yeah? How was that getting to know him and <laughs> sharing out those duties? Well, I think it depends on the families really, and depends okay. on the relationships. Sure. Um, so in South Korea, I guess those people who I spoke to, um, if they have a, their husband is coming from South Korea, there's a, it was very clear to me they had a very clear gender division. Mm-hmm. So a lot of husbands didn't do hardly anything at home, right? Uh, because they were the uh, breadwinners, sure. and then you know they believed men shouldn't do kind of uh, small jobs at home. So changing nappies. So, you know, there are examples of people actually, if they want their husband to do something, they have to ask them to do it rather than they voluntarily sharing. Um, on the other hand, people who got married to British people, you know, they, they say things like uh, their husband tried to help them. Mm-hmm. But this is important. They also use the word help. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's never kind of, I mean, you know, equal sharing. There are some very minority of people Japanese whose husband or British and they do almost equally but you know it was tiny minority so based on that actually the gender division continues whether it's South Korea or whether it's in Britain whether you got married to a British guy so for example my examples so you know me and Rob both we work (laughs) full-time you know my job is extremely demanding I'm extremely busy and so does Rob but actually, I'm the one who does the majority of housework. <laughs> I do the most of cooking uh, because I, you know, I'm a better cook. If yeah, I'm okay. honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a fact. Well, uh, they, so, they say uh, British people uh, kill an animal twice when they've killed it and when they cook it as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, but also I think um, I'm not sure whether it's the uh, within sort of uh, our kind of um, my relationship with Rob is. Uh, there are definitely gendered aspects to it. Obviously, I was socialized in you know the very traditional Korean environment. Therefore, consciously and subconsciously, 
I, I've noticed myself, you know, replicating that kind of a practice habitually. Mm-hmm. So when I come home and see things, I don't sit down and just relax. I was just constantly moving around, mm-hmm. doing you know housework and sorting things out. On the other hand, Rob just comes home and he will just will get his phone and you know there's quite differences. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, he he helps, he does, uh, but you know the gender division continues in my view. Just going back uh, to obviously growing up and everything like that. Do, do, is there things that you? Um, expected in a more of a broader sense. Obviously, you said about you expected people in top hats and the English gentleman. Mm-hmm. But is there anything you sort of thought um, it, it, more broadly, especially in terms of maybe education as well? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for example, what is the standard of education like, and how did you sort of make that move into the job you do now? Um, I. Education in Britain, and if I compare it to actually uh, South Korea, mm-hmm. in many ways, I mean, you know, still British education, I mean, you know, I prefer because uh, I think my education in South Korea was quite horrendous. Really? Because, uh, so basically, I'm not sure how much you, you know about sort of a Korean education. It's extremely uh, competitive. Mm-hmm. And uh, very much driven by a private market. Mm. So uh, going into um, top university is the all families project mm. because that really determines in, in many ways the success of uh, children's future. Mm-hmm. So, so when I was in South Korea, um, primary school, I was in a sort of a quite a big class. I think it was student numbers were 30, 40. Right. And uh, the the way of teaching was very um, didactic. So it was sort of, you know, told by the teacher one sided. Mm-hmm. So there was less room for kind of creativity or originality. And then middle school, especially high school. So we have a middle school for three years and then high school for three years. And that especially high school is absolutely death camp. <laughs> because it is. <laughs> It is. Just imagine that is the time, in my view, you are most creative, most energetic time, your teenage years. Yeah, you right? actually are. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. My blood was boiling and my head was feel like I was explored and I had nowhere to release it. And all I need to actually ask to do was going to school at seven o'clock in the morning and then coming back eleven o'clock at night. Yes, I can see your eyes go, oh. feel. <laughs> what? Yeah, that was my reality. So we... Wow. No, okay, I, I can understand death count. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we hired a van who drove us around in the morning. So this van driver will collect us who living in a similar area yeah. and then take us to school and drop us off. And then I think our lessons were, I, I can't remember what time it finished, something like maybe three o'clock, four o'clock. Mm-hmm. Then we have a, you know, after that, we are spending time until 11, self-study mm-hmm. in the classroom. So, so I think at first year in high school, I, I try, you know, quite hard to work, mm-hmm. study, but I think I completely lost my grip. Uh, it's just uh, mentally. Okay, yeah, I was going to say well, on reality. But, but... Yeah, I just lost interest in study and then, I don't know. So I started to uh, basically sneak out from school after lessons and go to uh, sit in the music club, um, live DJ, and then nice. coming back just before my uh, van and ping me up, uh, you know, before like a, around 10, half 10. <laughs> so my parents always believed I was at school working really hard, mm-hmm. uh, which wasn't true. Did, did they never find out? No. Never. So I did that for two years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, still managed to go to university mm. uh, with a, a decent scholarship, actually. Well, I mean, if you're working that much anyway, that's... that's... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so that was my experience. And I do remember saying to my friends, you know, I never want to raise my child in Korea. Oh. So at the time, obviously, I didn't have a clue I was going abroad. Mm-hmm. I was going to live in another country. 
it never occurred to me at the time at all. Mm. But I was always saying to my friends, I never want to raise a child in Korea mm. because I always felt the education was so horrendous. Because, you know, the, the students, the children who should have a, a life and enjoy, mm -hmm. they just don't have a life. Yeah. Um, so it, for me, it was just absolutely crazy. And then coming to the UK, so obviously I had a, a university education in Korea, which was another big disappointment for me because I was really excited to go to university after three years of death camp. <laughs> um, but for me, it was extension of a high school. Okay. So I was really uh, disappointed and struggled. So, uh, you know, um, I got a degree, but I it was near fail. Um, and then when I started university uh, at Bath, I absolutely loved it <laughs> because I loved the fact there was so much room for me to actually um, explore by myself. I loved the independence. Mm -hmm. So you, you get lecture and you get sort of, a, you know, the sort of frameworks and ideas. But the rest of them, you have to feel it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think it was brilliant that having that education. However, having been in education for now for many years and observing, you know, what's happening in, you know, current educational system in the UK, I'm quite saddened, really. Okay. Because, um, especially when I look at what's happening in, you know, uh, schools, yeah. uh, funding cuts, you know, the current government, uh, what they've done to education, but also what's happening in higher education. Mm. Is very worrying. Yes. So the introduction of uh, you know high tuition fees, mm -hmm. which is completely wrong in my view, mm -hmm. that really created um, this kind of a consumer culture amongst the students. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, as I said, I, I have befriended quite a lot of lecturers along mm. the way, and and they said, well, I mean, a lot of them have left actually since I left. Mm. Um, I like to think because because they couldn't take it after. I was in there. <laughs> but um, I'd say that they have all said though that. Um, there is a wave of new students who do see it as, well, I'm paying for this, mm. so you need to give me what I want. Yeah. The teachers then go, the lecturers just then go to their superiors and go, look, we can't deliver what we have to deliver mm. because they're being like this. And the superiors then go, well, they're paying, so give them what they want. Mm. Which means that actually it seems that it's going to belittle everyone's um, degree. Mm. You know, it, it, it won't mean anything if they're kind of getting helped too much. and. Mm. Um, is, is that the sort of thing you're referring to? or Yes, that's definitely uh, what's happening. I mean, you know, um, I was, until last year, I was a program leader. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as a program leader, you kind of uh, have a sort of a face-to-face -face encounters with the students, mm. especially a lot of complaints. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of them are quite legitimate. And obviously, they have a right to do that. Mm -hmm. But there are other things you just think, you know, it's just... Yeah, you could be getting on with this. Why? Yeah, it's, just, it's just excuses, it, right? Yeah, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a it's very simple basic questions about respect mm -hmm. and, the, you know, the reciprocity. Because what I also found kind of, a, I don't know, coming from quite different culture and, uh, you know, background... You know, in Korea still, you know, teachers, professors, they are hardly uh, respected. Mm -hmm. And then students treat them, you know, with respect. But with these, a lot of students I, I see here, I mean, I have a quite good relationship with many of my students. But having said that, there are other students. I don't know whether it's because they, they are insecure. But, you mm -hmm. know, you see them on the street after the lecture and you're trying to smile at them. And they just pretend they didn't see me. Oh, okay. And I, I do have this experience a lot. Yeah. They just walk past or this sour face. Yeah. And I just think, I just don't get it for me. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's not necessary because they are paying whatever, 9000 I think it's, there is a definitely that generation or kind of a... Yeah, I, I think a huge problem as well is probably that uh, there's a lot of people who um, are my age or younger who don't know how to talk to adults. Mm. Um, and I actually think this stems from the, the fact that I, I think there was, when I went to college, it was 
compulsory that you have to go to college. Mm. But college has always been an in-between between, you know, school and university. Yeah. And it's the perfect place for people who don't want to do education to mm. not go. Yeah. Because what that then means is that they all then get jobs and do what they want yeah. to do and leave everyone who wants to study alone. Mm. When they go to college, they then go, well, all my friends are now going to university. Mm. And of course, big business loves this because universities is all about business now. Mm. So they think, yeah, good money. But it ruins everything because the people that didn't want to go to college are now going to university to pretty much waste two years partying. They'll drop out just before mm. they actually have to complete the degree, which is why possibly there's that rise in, in, um, in, in tuition fee as well. It, it just seems oversaturated so that the people that actually want to be there yeah. aren't getting what they want. Um, yeah. And the ones that just want, that's actually bad phrasing, they aren't getting what they need. Mm. And the ones that go there and just want a degree mm. because they're there, mm. they, they sort of get, I don't know, they're getting too many benefits, I guess, because they're just being, yeah, okay, we need to keep you in. We need to keep paying. Mm. There does seem to be that that is going to be probably the biggest thing to affect, I think, my generation. I know everyone keeps on going about my generation, um, good and bad. But actually, I think this is the one thing that is going to be a big problem because in a few years, companies will now know, well, how, hold on, university is pointless because mm. most of the people who are applying from university can't think for themselves. Um, they, they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't spell, things like that. Wh why? Why mm. is that? And also, there's so many. So it's going to um, belittle what university means, really. And I worry about that. No, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you are absolutely right to uh, worry about it because you know I do worry about it yeah and uh, you know especially my colleagues senior colleagues who who's been at, you know higher education for longer than me obviously they've seen the changes mm -hmm. over the years and it's quite staggering mm -hmm. and um, yeah they 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 just openly say I'm um, you know they they are glad they don't have to linger too long <laughs> because because it's it's tough. Yeah. The demands is tough. Um, you, you know, and the introduction of do you know TEF teaching excellence framework. I, I don't. So universities, one of the kind of a, previously the criteria universities are assessed and get funded by the government was what we call a REF research excellence framework. Mm -hmm. So it's based on the research performance of the universities will determine how much funding they get from the government. Um, the current co uh, conservative government introduced something called the TEF, Teaching Excellence Framework. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, there are various sort of uh, criteria to measure the teaching excellence uh, of the universities. And one of the key things is um, National Student Survey, NSS. Ah. I get emails of them still. Yes. Yeah, to because, have to complete these surveys, yeah. Yes, because it's highly politicized and uh, the outcomes of the NSS will have a huge impact on the, uh, you know, TAF, but also recruitment. Mm -hmm. There are a whole lot of implications. So what it means, inevitably, university becomes almost slave of this the NSS mm -hmm. and um, just you know, becomes sort of a lost, in some ways, the authority to student to kind of stand form. You know, there are certain things you have to say no. There, there should be a line. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Because you can't take it all. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've said recently in the news is a lot about Canada and America. where You've got so many students now who are really going above what, what well, well, above heads to get what they want. Mm. And and they do get what they want because I think that the universities are afraid of what might happen on social media about the yeah. university, about the faculty. Um, staff are, are sacked. And, mm. and you sort of think, how? And it's usually over something really, really stupid. And, mm. and because they are kind of making themselves slaves to this process, I mean, I hadn't heard of that, but I do understand the, uh, the, the process of, you know, all these um, reviews and things like that. I, it's just it's just ridiculous. I actually do remember um, having this uh, lecture on, where basically the whole thing was to talk about what we're going to do in five years' time, all mm. that stuff. Okay, typical, fine. 
And then it was basically, okay, now you need to complete this module. Mm. This is, um, we're going to help you in these classes. But the module was all about what I've learned here and how I'm going to um, uh, basically make the university look good. Um, oh. it, there was an awful lot of like answering all these questions and things. They actually built it into our course. Okay. And that, I didn't like that, as you can imagine. Um, not that you can do anything about it. Um, but it, there does seem to be a big problem. Yes, I mean, it's, a, it's a extremely political mm -hmm. um, and it's quite tedious as well. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a, in a way, the, the government has sort of, the current government has sort of introduced this, this kind of uh, environment and culture mm -hmm. of education. They're trying to sort of emulate, trying to get more and more similar to sort of American model. Yeah, even though they really shouldn't because America is so low on the list. Mm. I don't know, I mean, obviously they're just seeing dollar signs, aren't they? So, um, you know, I mean, it's a great shame. Um, the, the whole, the neoliberal kind of ideology and how it is shaping mm. uh, the education. I was actually doing this, um, uh, giving out, because I teach a unit called Politics and Ideology mm -hmm. with the final year students. So we do, I give a reading, um, mostly uh, <clears throat> journal articles every week, and then we do discuss the, during the seminar. So one of them was about the, uh, you know, English high, higher education based on neoliberalism and mm. how it has moved on from social rights to individual rights. Yeah. And the uh, Basically, this professor in Nottingham, John Homewood, he, he has written this article and he's arguing when you look at government, uh, you know, report and papers, white papers, the kind of compared to previous, you know, years, now there is no kind of a uh, role of uh, university education in terms of uh, its uh, impact on society. Mm -hmm. It's more about how it is benefiting individuals. Therefore, you know, this kind of uh, policy papers has a huge impact because people don't learn to be able to actually see the, the important position of a university within wide, in relation to wider society. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. when, when I had this discussion with my students and actually they said to me, before they read this paper, they actually thought about university, something just to do with themselves. Yeah. Something very individual. Mm -hmm. They can get a degree which will help them to get a decent job. But actually, they didn't see the wider benefits of uh, university education, what kind of a role it plays in society. For me, I mean, yes, absolutely, I agree with you in terms of uh, how, uh, you know, there are many students who shouldn't be actually at university and they're there, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Definitely, it's oversaturated. Having said that, having uh, well-educated, uh, you know, population citizens can be a very important step in terms sure. of uh, political awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there are a lot of kind of uh, important kind of benefits university education can bring to society. And uh, when government trying to see individual student as a money pound. Mm -hmm. They, they just completely, you know, kind of uh, uprooted this kind of important discourses from Paulus documents. Yeah, and it's, so that sort of practice is going to galvanise the middle classes as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't really see an end to it any, anytime soon. No, <laughs> no, certainly not. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole, uh, you know, neoliberal influence at the moment is, is quite dominant. I mean, Shocking, I, isn't it? Yes. Um, I'm sure there will be time, you know, the tide will turn and we will see hopefully, uh, you know, something kind of significant changes take place to or overtake. But for now, it's there mm -hmm. and it's quite dominant. So, um, but, you know, we have to resist, yes. Yeah. I think there's, there's possibly a confusion as well with its supporters because obviously everyone wants uh, a basic rights for everyone. You know, there there needs to be the sort of social decent kindness as well. But when it, but but unfortunately, the people who support that, some of them are pushing the wrong agenda because, as you mm. say, they're, they're moving it in that way of well, mm. you're making it about individuals, and then it becomes 
very much like America, where you can sue anyone mm. for anything because mm. it's money. Um, just stepping away from that a little bit, we should talk about um, what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, is this is this uh, are you are you being funded? Are you being funded for this one as well? Because the previous one was a PhD. Yeah. So, um, and and this is all about North Korea. Yes, I mean, yes, the, the, my PhD was funded by the university, and uh, my North Korean project is well also funded by the university. Okay, so that's good. My current university, Bournemouth University. Yeah. So yes. Um, yeah, that's something, I don't know, um, I didn't know, uh, I mean, in, I started my research in 2015, but it was, um, I think a couple of years before I started to know about there are North Koreans in the UK. But <laughs> before then, I didn't have any clue, mm. but as soon as I, um, heard about it, I, had a sort of a just instant kind of a, I don't know, spark of interest. Yeah. I wanted to find out about them. So that's how I started. And uh, being, you know, raised in Korea, obviously the ongoing tensions with North Korea was part and parcel of Korean life. So I do remember constantly feeling insecure and worried about, you know, North Korea invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously within that kind of a context, North Koreans were always described as, uh, you know, not as an individual humans, but like a devils, really. Yeah, the other, isn't it? The yeah. absolute the other. Um, but it was interesting to actually, for the first time, when I met my first participant uh, and talked to the person, and you realize, actually, they're exactly the same as us. We just, you know, ordinary human beings have the same desires and sadness and feelings. Mm -hmm. So that was quite eye-opening. The the only sort of, I mean, just just talking strictly about borders, the only comparison I can really think of is mm. the whole East-West Germany split, mm. um, and it's a sort of similar story there. But with this, you've actually got an entirely different culture. Mm -hmm. You know, really, okay, you have uh, you know the things like communists and everything in in in, uh, in Germany, but the, it's it's really different. It's it's. Yeah. Um, is that been the most exciting thing about talking to these people? And, and how do you find them, actually? That's... Well, uh, there are a few activists who are already quite prominent. Okay. So they are uh, accessible. So I've identified um, this particular individual who is already kind of, you know, well-known and then contacted the person and um, explained. So um, we had a meeting and that was the starting point. But um, to be frank, um, getting access to the, uh, the, the rest of the people weren't easy. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously I got a lot of help from you know, this particular individual to, um, that he introduced other people. But um, I always find that quite uh, difficult because a lot of people actually are scared mm. or worried about, you know, revealing their identity and that could affect obviously their families left in North Korea mm -hmm. uh, because the threats are still there. Mm -hmm. So people don't necessarily want to talk about it. But also, especially the issues around the you know, women faced. So my understanding is about 50% of, or I don't know, it could be more, North Korean defector women have uh, one way or another had um, quite serious you know, human rights issues kind of violated in, in the process of, uh, you know, escaping North Korea, especially in China. Yeah, this was on your, your yeah. article, wasn't it? Yeah, because uh, they are either trafficked or mm. they voluntarily sell themselves as a survival strategy. Yeah. So in, in the process, you know, the majority of them are sold to a, you know, place very exploitive, and inadequate, basically, mm -hmm. in humane conditions. Yeah. Um, so when they went through quite traumatic experiences, and then they managed to escape from that situation, and a lot of them actually now have established families. So they, oh. they, you know, a lot of defectors, they, they, some of them escape with their family members mm -hmm. and they stay together. But there are a lot of families. You know, they might have escaped alone or together, but during the process, they lost their family members. Right. 
then they, um, you know, either in China or South Korea or in the UK, they will meet someone else and they will uh, remarry or settle. So because of that, they don't, you know, what I've noticed was they don't really want to talk about because they feel ashamed. Their experiences of, you know, uh, sexual harassment, violation, yeah. all of this, they don't want to go back. Yeah. And even a lot of them, actually, they don't talk about these things with their husband. Wow, so they don't even know that it's happened? Well, I think they do. Okay. Of course they do. But, you know, it's something... I'm sure some, some couples probably talk about openly, but I've also heard other cases, you know, they don't really want to share these kind of things with their husbands because it's, it's, it's a quite painful experience and they yeah. don't necessarily kind of open their wounds again. Yeah. So because of that, I've noticed that it was very difficult to actually get access to women who were willing to talk about these issues. Hmm. Um, Has there been any resistance? Like when you have contacted people? Have people... Oh yeah, absolutely. People yeah. said no or, you know, initially said yes and then um, say no again. So yes. Um, but, you know, those who uh, thankfully well, there, there were quite a few people who were quite happy to share their experiences. Um, and that was very, um, very painful and quite eye-opening, really. Hmm. And I mean, it's just unbelievable what they have to go through. I don't think a lot of people really understand that either. Um, because obviously, well, some people obviously look to North Korea and just think it's... Uh, funny, uh, quite mm. frankly, because it, it yeah. just doesn't seem possible. It doesn't really seem, you know, yeah. and, and the, the people that run it um, as well, they, they, they're very big characters. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't really feel possible to lots of my friends and lots of people I've talked to. So they just laugh it off. But then there's the other side of people who understand it, but are not aware at all about what it takes to get out and to, and especially when obviously borders onto China, to get through. I mean, I think, do you think that there, the, the, more and more of this will come out, do you think, as time goes by? Because it does seem... No. No? Um, I think it's getting harder. Because, oh, really? Yes. So what I was told is since Kim Jong-un came into power, mm -hmm. the, uh, the border control became much uh, stricter. That's true. Yes, mm. actually, uh, because aren't they getting... Now the border patrol, because what used to happen was they used to pay them, they used to bribe them, but now yeah. don't they um, uh, get paid, even, they get allowed to keep the money if they actually hand them in as well. I'm, I'm sure I've heard that. Uh, okay, no, I don't know about that, but what I heard was, you know, in the past, the, you know, the border patrol was, let's just say, uh, in between was much further away, but right. now it's like every 500 meters, there are, yeah, and also... Um, apparently they got this tracker from Germany, this, this sort of device right. which can track the people who escape quite easily. Um, so, you know, so people really find it difficult to actually smuggle people out or uh, escape. I mean, still, mm -hmm. the bribery, corruption is very rife in North Korea. Of course. So people use that's those means to escape. But my understanding is actually people escaping is less than before because it becomes more difficult. When you say that they, they got a device off of uh, technology off of Germany, mm. how did they get that, do you know? Well, I think the, uh, the government must be uh, import from Germany. Okay, they just yeah, do. Yes, to, to actually track mm. down the people. The, the, yeah, the only reason why I was sort of surprised when you said that you don't think anything else really will come through is just because um, I was looking into it recently and it does, it just felt like to me that they perhaps getting ready to open themselves up a little bit more. <laughs> you're shaking your head, uh, but just because they have this airport now and they're, mm. they're sorting out this beach, is that just all pretense? No, I don't think it's a pretense. Um, I suppose in in some ways, I mean, it's very difficult to actually, um, you know, in a way, understand the mindset of, you know, the uh, North Korean uh, kind of government sure. and the regime, uh, but they are very clever. So I think the Kim Jong Un definitely trying to make sure his sort of a, you know position is sort of a, uh, safely consolidated mm -hmm. or protected. So obviously he wanted to seek out uh, kind of a, you know 
sanctions lifted by the America, mm -hmm. and on the condition that you know they did denuclearize some of the uh, their plants. But given the you know the the meetings between Trump and uh, Kim Jong Un didn't go down very well. Mm. Yeah, things are sort of. A, so Could you know, have thought it. <laughs> mm. So you know, on one level, this is in interesting because. I was delivering this uh, lecture in North Korea last year to my students and then all of a sudden after my lecture things got really changed right uh, because there was all of a sudden this summit with the South Korean leaders and then things look much rosier and all of a sudden you, you think oh my god they are going to you know take down all the um, these nuclear plants and then actually you know they might say that but nothing has really happened mm -hmm. So, in some ways, I think Kim Jong Un knows, uh, you know, they can't maintain without actually economically opening uh, the North Korea. Mm -hmm. So, my inkling is they are probably trying to emulate um, sort of Chinese cases, sure. opening up sort of economically, but maintaining that absolutely totalitarian kind of, you know, that, that control. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, you know, aspects of it is opening up economically and the secondary economy, what we call, so that it's not just former state economy, mm -hmm. but informal economies are actually quite active in North Korea. Okay. So um, especially the role of females yeah. running this informal economy, so the, what they call Changmada. So... You know, North Korea, so you look a little bit puzzled yeah. in North Korea, yeah. uh, because it's a communist system, they are supposed to run by the, every, all the economy is supposed to run by the state, mm -hmm. state control. So that used to be the case uh, before, but obviously since the mid-1990s, the economy collapsed right. and uh, it became impossible. And also when you look at the history of other socialist government, the previous government, you know, no single government managed to survive based on completely 100% state-controlled economy. Just yeah, that true. didn't work. Yeah. So there's always, whether it's the uh, recognized by the government or illegal, there is always private market run, you know, black mm -hmm. market behind. And so in North Korea, it's the same. So it used to be what they call Jiang Madang used to be sort of illegal, mm -hmm. but the government took blind eyes because they rely on it. Yeah. But now I think this becomes accepted part of it. So there are obviously still illegal aspects of it, but other uh, private markets are actually you know, accepted by the government. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in North Korea, the Ch there are Chinese migrant group called Hagyo. Uh, so they are the ethnically Chinese okay. they settled in North Korea. They used to be uh, very low class mm -hmm. because North Korea, you know, they, they are racist. Mm -hmm. um, but now, because of their Chinese connection, they are the, one of the richest because they can go to China, bring these goods and sell. And so they become sort of a business people. Mm -hmm. And um, that really elevated their, their social status. So it's, it's really just what they're doing now is just about keeping that money coming in so they can continue what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. But also they use a lot of, you know, some of the uh, mechanisms they use to create basically the dollars for the leaders. Mm -hmm. Use hacking, but also creating uh, like a, a circulating fake dollars. Yeah. They use all sorts of uh, illegal kind of method to create the money and then they're fed into Whose bank? Uh, Kim Jong Un's bank account in Switzerland. <laughs> it's very true. I'm not, you know, I know you, you might find it funny, but it's it's really true. There are yeah. designated. I was reading this article about this this person who defected from North Korea, but used to be uh, to take an important position over this dollar making uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And there's a dedicated army of people who actually doing it. It's their job. Wow, it doesn't. I mean, yeah. The reason why I'm laughing is because it just doesn't seem possible that they could get away for, with it for so long. Uh, mm, but they've they've done it, and and you know they are. Do you, do you think there is an element as well, though, that 
they can't really open up too much because I suppose the fear would be that um, where, you know, I imagine there are an awful lot of people living there mm. that believe in the system, don't believe they're being duped in any way, mm. so might actually have a problem if they then start to open up to the, the outside world. They might mm. then stand up and go, hang on, you're not our leader then. Yes, yes and no, because now the fact is uh, a lot of foreign information infiltrated uh, right. to North Korea because, uh, you know, I mean, it's illegal, but people get like a DVDs mm -hmm. and South Korean dramas uh, from China. <laughs> so wow. a lot of people actually watch South Korean drama or, uh, you know, movies. Yeah. So they can, you know, what do these dramas, they are dramatized, but they reflect the kind of contemporary life in Korea. And they can see people are much well-fed, dressed better, you know, they yeah. can see a lot of things. Yeah, I, actually, that's an important one. I think um, it's just seeing how, you know, people looking healthy. Mm. That That's a huge one because you can't really fake that. Um, I, I'm, there's someone I might do a podcast with who um, who left um, communist Russia. Mm. Um, her dad was, uh, I think, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I think she said that he was uh, ex-KGB. Mm. And they left. And when they got to um, Australia, that's mm. where they went to, um, they sent pictures of themselves back and we're in a, in, a, in a supermarket and they replied, you know, don't lie to us. You can tell those oranges are fake and everything. But actually, you know, if, uh, yeah, they said, they said, uh, oh, we, we know there are probably soldiers with guns, mm -hmm. you know, actually they said that's why they didn't believe it because there were no soldiers, which is, mm -hmm. tells you everything. So, to, but if they were well fed because they weren't, they just got there, it may have been a different story because you mm -hmm. can't fake that. No. Um, one of my participants actually, um, she gave an example of, uh, she, so she was watching a uh, South Korean drama mm. and then she said what she was quite shocked was there was this bit about, there was this protest going on in South Korea and the people were throwing these raw eggs to someone they didn't like, yeah, as a protest. <laughs> but she was shocked by the fact uh, in South Korea people have a spare eggs to throw. To throw, yeah. <laughs> Because wow. that's, that's unthinkable in North Korea. Yeah. But these are simple things, but it reveals a lot about society. Yeah. So, you know, these kind of things really happening a lot. So what I've uh, kind of uh, read, sort of learned from my reading is that in the past, you know, the, the people who I interviewed, they, they escaped North Korea, the majority of them, because they were hungry. Mm -hmm. um, so they tried to get some food from China and then sometimes it turns sour. So they, they come into a situation where they couldn't go back. Mm. Uh, but now there are people, you know, want to escape because they realize actually, um, you know, probably they're duped and there, there are different world out there. From talking to these people, what kind of, how, how do they sort of come to that point where they go, actually, we need to leave? Mm. The one of my participants, well, so he was an army officer, he was in the army and he, he, he was a brother in a you know nice middle class family quite mm -hmm. comfortably. So, the basically what he said, you know, when you raised in that environment, you never question your um you know the government. Mm. And then when he was in the army, the 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 famine started. So he he watched a lot of soldiers die of hunger. But right. the other thing was when. He, when he was at school, he learned army is the, you know, people who protect you. <laughs> but when he actually joined the army for the first time, so, you know, when you join it, you have all the new things. <laughs> and then he had uh, some presents from his school friends and all that. And it was completely stolen. So his uniform was new. And then when he woke up, it was exchanged into old one and his new uniforms were stolen by another soldier, senior soldier. So that was one sort of a starting point. And then the other one was he witnessed a lot of uh, stealing and rape of the, by the soldiers, of civilians. So um, he said one, one example was the people were taking turns to cook, right, in the army. And the senior will come to this chef or cook and say, create seven dishes. And then obviously you need to get ingredients, but what you, you get ingredients 
that has nowhere near you can create seven dishes. So what he's saying is go out and steal from civilians and create seven dishes. That's the order. But obviously he doesn't say that directly. So he was sleeping and his senior woke him up at night. So he said, where are, where are we going? And he said, follow me. So basically they were stealing. So he started completely disillusioned mm -hmm. By these experiences and then uh, one of his jobs was basically there were a lot of soldiers because they were so hungry in the army they started to run away to their homes so as a single man he, he was able to kind of travel because he wasn't tied by families yeah. all over the countries to bring the soldiers back to the army so what happened was during this time he saw what the country looked like and it was absolutely dire. So he started to really question, you know, I thought my country was the best in the world. Sure. And it was absolutely rotten, he realized. So he wanted to really see what outside the world is like. Mm. I think that really drove him to do that. And other cases, you know, also North Korea is very um, class-based. Mm -hmm. So there are three different groups. The government's divided. Uh, one is so uh, North Korean class system is Songban. One is the I forgot the name, but sort of like a you know high ranking the desirable. Yeah. These are the ones who fought during the you know Japanese rule uh, against the Japanese or fought with uh, Kim Il Sung, you mm -hmm. know the founder of North Korea. Yeah. Um, and, and the one who's still technically uh, yes. in charge. <laughs> and then the um, the. Middle is sort of um, in between, but the last one, those undesirables are the ones who have got families in South Korea or who used to be uh, work for Japanese during Japanese occupation. Mm -hmm. And once you are categorized as undesirable, it, it remains in the family record and that stops the next generation to actually doing things. Mm. So it, it affects their university entrance, you know, their job, everything. Yeah. So these people obviously have a, you know, a not great life because yeah. they are constantly, permanently stigmatized. So I think that kind of things gives this sort of, a, you know, less um, illusion about the, the country. And then obviously with the hunger and everything that forced them to kind of, a, you know, let's live. And then once they also, a lot of them have families in China, mm -hmm. relatives. So they have opportunities of moving back and forth, um, you know, sometimes with the permission. Yeah. Then that gives, you know, how um, China is different. Mm. So that sort of will encourage them to actually, yeah, let's escape. To do it, yeah. What about a future? So you, you don't see really a future, in the, in the short term at least, mm. where anything's going to change. What, what about in North Korea in general? I mean, from people you talk to, I mean, do, do, you, do they see or did they see any changes for them personally over there? Um, not immediately, I don't think so. I mean, okay. they do a lot of work to bring, that, bring the changes mm -hmm. to North Korea. And so they, one of the things they do is actually, uh, you know, sending out foreign information. Mm -hmm. um, so ordinary people can see how other people outside North Korea live. Yeah. Um, but for me, it will, it will take a long time to have some real meaningful changes uh, take place in North Korea, in my view. Mm -hmm. is, is there not at all, do you think there's no, absolutely no desire by the ruling class to make life better over there? No, I don't think that's the case. I, I'm sure, I, I don't necessarily think, you know, they, they are deliberately making people miserable. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It was just that when it happened was the, the, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, they used to rely on Soviet Union's help a lot. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, this big helping hand's gone, and then they just mismanaged the whole economy. Mm -hmm. So it kind of collapsed. But I don't really think, you know, that's what they really want. But probably it's just the outcome of uh, mismanagement and trying to you know, control uh, the whole thing without actually opening up to the world and right. for the sake of their own benefit. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think 
in my view, uh, Kim Jong Un is not necessarily because he's beneficial um, leader, uh -huh. but in order to make sure his position is legitimately held, uh -huh. I think he will try to make sure economically the country is viable. Uh -huh. Do, do, do you think, um, or well, from, from talking to some of these people, has they, have they said anything that surprised you about, or even how they felt about South Korea? Oh yeah, I mean they they are very uh, disenchanted about mm. South Korea. I mean I don't know whether how much you know about it, but um, a lot of uh, people who settled in South Korea struggle mm. because of prejudice. So you know, when North Korean people go to South Korea. I think they have, because we, we share the same ethnic background and technically and legally North Koreans are actually also uh, seen as a South Koreans according to South Korean constitution. Mm. But once they get there, they are com treated very differently mm. as a complete outsider and uh, kind of a backward. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, and also because of the, they're coming from very different, uh, you know, system. So they, they used to, um, you know, the, the, everything is so provided by the government. Yes. And then South Korea is just super materialistic. Yes. Um, so they, they just don't... Well, I, I, yeah, I, again, the reason why I asked that is because I did watch a documentary at one point, which was... Uh, it followed around a few people that had defected and they wanted to go home just because they yes. weren't used to uh, this system where they had to fend for themselves essentially yeah. um, and and it was it, it struck them as, as a harder life even if they liked particular freedoms they got yes. it was well actually on a day-to-day -day basis yes you know d have you seen any of that yes because a lot of uh, the thing is the majority of my participants mm -hmm. who live in the UK used to live in South Korea Right, okay. So they actually lived in South Korea and they, they left South Korea because they weren't happy. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, comparable prime examples. One participant, so she uh, escaped North Korea with her son and granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And then her, her daughters, who I think they were uh, caught and killed. Um, so they lived in China for many years, uh, but eventually they, they didn't feel safe, so they, they escaped to South Korea using very difficult routes. Mm -hmm. So her son was, when they left, he was a teenager. So he was obviously quite clever, so he uh, mastered Chinese when, when they were in China. Mm -hmm. And then when they came to Korea, he went to, he studied and he went to a uh, very good university in South Korea. Um, so he, wa he was able to speak quite a few languages. But because of his North Korean background, he couldn't get any decent job. <laughs> and the people are saying things like, if you betrayed your, co your own country, how can I trust you? Wow. Yeah. Even though they know what's going on? Yeah. And then... Uh, so, you know, he applied so many jobs and eventually just um, came to a conclusion. So he had to work like a night shift driving taxi or mm. working in a petrol station yeah. with this, you know, university, Disney University qualification. And obviously... You're being because, treated like a criminal, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, so he had a family, but that really also affected because he was working at night. So during the daytime, he had to sleep you know, in order to manage, but that man, they never could have a, um, his son's children or the daughter, the children, uh, friends could come to their house. Mm -hmm. So the whole family was sort of like really struggling and he was struggling with depression. And then the other participants were, they requalified themselves and opened a restaurant mm -hmm. in South Korea. And he was doing very well. But the, this female participant started to work as a reporter, but she uh, revealed that she was a North Korean uh, okay. as a reporter. Oh, I may have seen a bit of it. Is it was this in the news at all? No. Okay. Um, so there are a few people who actually worked as a sort of, a, you know, 
uh, but she was uh, working as a local reporter. Okay. Okay. And then obviously the pe local people who used to come to restaurant realized that's the, uh, the restaurant owner. After that, when they turn up for the uh, restaurant in the morning, all the tables and chairs are turned upside down or are all messy. Or they get phone calls like, um, oh, so you are from North Korea. And then they just, uh, the, the restaurant used to be really busy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it started to die down and they started to go next door. <laughs> so eventually that forced these families to actually leave South Korea and, um, you know, sought another life in Britain. Wow. So this is a, this is a couple of sort of examples, but there are, you know, a lot of examples for ex people saying, doing the exactly same job. Yeah. But getting paid half of what South Koreans get paid. So even though in the UK, a lot of people do very meager jobs like, you know, the, um, working in a restaurant mm -hmm. for South Korean owners mm -hmm. or working in the supermarkets. But they say at least here, they don't get that kind of discrimination. They just get paid, whether it's minimum wage or whatever, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you know, they feel happier. Yeah. I think discrimination, you know, if you can have that not in your life, that's probably worth more than the money. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's the same with uh, a lot of things. Uh, you know, they, they always say that if a boss just shows that he appreciates the work that's being mm. done, people won't necessarily need pay rises. And I think that's an important thing. I think uh, it surprises me that there would be such a, a dislike just just because of obviously it's so well documented so well reported mm. what's going on there that you'd think that there would be a bit more <laughs> generosity kindness no it's an interesting thing i mean one time i had a, an interview with this um uh, kbs south korean sort of a broadcasting company mm -hmm. about my views about people who are leaving south korea because of this kind of discrimination and i actually said you know you, we in my view change the whole kind of uh, people's attitudes we need embedded sort of uh, this kind of discussion in education from very young age mm -hmm. so people are really aware of the issues and the difficulties these people face but i think it, this is to do with a lot of things happening in south korea mm -hmm. as i said it, you know the culture in south korea has become super materialistic it's more americanized now i i understand the, the very um the, the people are kind of pursuing very superficial things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people make a judgment about other people mm -hmm. based on how much money they have. You know, the, the kind of... And I think people lack or are not interested in actually other people's vulnerability or mm -hmm. difficulties. A lot of younger generations said they are not really interested in, you know, North Koreans or their issues. Yeah. So there is a, a lot of work needs to be done to change that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, one of my participants have got siblings living in South Korea. So they are very successful. They, they requalify themselves as doctors and they've got children. But my participant has a very strong North Korean accent. So when she visited her sisters in South Korea, they were in the lift. They live in, a, you know, in South Korea, every, almost everybody lives in the big apartment block. Mm -hmm. So her sister asked her not to talk <laughs> because she didn't want uh, people to know she's from North Korea. So she sure. hides her identity as a North Korean defector mm -hmm. and her children uh, don't say her parents are from North Korea. Yeah. So they just pretend they're South Koreans because of prejudice. Yeah. So it's very telling. It's going to take a while, but do you think there'll ever be a time where people just won't be like that, you know? I mean, I hope, but I'm not quite sure. I mean, you know, I mean, we have to stay positive, but when you look at, you know, history and what's happening in a lot of places, mm -hmm. um, discrimination, prejudice, it always, it always seems to be always there, one way yeah. or another. Um, but you know, it's extremely sad. Yeah. Because for me, especially, you know, I'm myself living as sort of a ethnic minority. So I do sympathize uh, with, you know, those who are vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and when you actually look at 
North Korean defectors who managed to escape to South Korea were here. They are extremely resourceful, mm -hmm. extremely, you know, they have to be also clever mm -hmm. because it's the, um, you know, almost like a survivor of the fittest. Yes, yeah. It is because they go through so much challenges and they, they, they have to use their ingenuity to be mm -hmm. able to actually overcome those uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. But once they get to South Korea, it just they're completely overlooked for by many people. I mean, there are people, obviously, they, they do care about these people and trying to make their life better. But mm. the majority of population uh, is not really happening and uh, a lot of people are really struggling. So there are a lot of things can be done uh, from the government, the media, uh, individuals, in all different levels, really. Mm. Well, I think we've probably covered everything that we need to cover unless there's anything else that you'd like to yeah. say or talk about yeah. is there anything that you you uh, particularly want to uh, put across uh, especially because of your book and everything no no I think uh, yeah, no I think we covered uh, yeah pretty much really okay well thank you very much no thank you it was uh, really nice I, yeah lots of things uh, <laughs> I discovered there <laughs> oh good yeah I hope it was all right no it was great um, I mean the North Korea thing is just so uh, as it, that I mean that is just beyond my imagination really what's going on I can't mm. really quite get it I mean I obviously mm. I hear all the facts and I hear all the yes, things about yeah. it but it's still like oh there that's going on isn't it mm. which isn't great I mean it, and, and that's why I was surprised when you said about South Korea being the way like, that it is with prejudice and everything because mm. you think that they're living right next door surely they're a bit more you know on it but there you go <laughs> no you see um, a lot of North Korean defectors living in South Korea struggle with the language as well. Right. So we speak Korean mm -hmm. both, but North Korean, it's a South Korea, like everywhere else, you know, language evolves. Yeah. So because South Korea sort of opened up, you know, to, to other countries, um, there are a lot of sort of anglicized aspects in terms of languages. You know, very different. But North Korean, Korean mm -hmm. is almost frozen in time. Yeah? yeah. So let's say ice cream. We say ice cream. So we borrow in Korea, English right. word. But in, in North Korea, I think it's like a direct translation, something like a frozen rock. <laughs> so, you know, when you hear this, to me, it's like a, probably almost... If I use the analogy, it seems like you are hearing Victorian language now. Sure. So I think, so there is aspects of people looking down on North Koreans as almost like, a, you know, out of date. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, all this. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. No, thank you. So there you have it. A really excellent chat, I think. I certainly came away feeling a bit smarter. But, you know, I always find, and... I know that so many people feel this way, but once you have a chat with somebody and it's really good, you get somewhere. But here's the peculiar thing. Every time I do one of these podcasts, I, you know, actually it's something that everyone's experienced. I walk away, half an hour later, I'm sat on the train and I'm thinking, ah, oh, damn it, I should have, I really should have asked that. Um, there's always something and every day since I've been doing this with you, Rob, Damon and Brian. So perhaps, perhaps, perhaps the future, you know, I might revisit um, and I should because we, we seem to be chipping away at something and perhaps we can go deeper. But yes, um, fantastic to see them as well. As, as I said, I went down to their place, to the Bardic House and uh, not just drinking with Rob, some good West Country cider, but also gorging on Jews, lovely cooking. Um, the kimchi, the gochujang, everything that she made was wholesome, lovely, and I probably put on about two stone. So a good time, wonderful hosts, and thank you both, Rob and Ju, for your hospitality. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in so far. Obviously, uh, the podcast is an experiment, really. I, I don't know how, where it will go. I don't know how many of these there will be, but... There seems to be interest, and I'm enjoying the hell out of it. So, let's see how we go. Thanks for listening. <laughs>